Daybreak Star Indian Cultural Center, opened in 1977, is an urban reservation, a gathering place, and a home to the more than 150,000 Indian community members in the Seattle area. Unique in that it was reclaimed for our community through direct action by Native activists, today it is a stunning example of how, no matter where we are, Indigenous people are both resilient and determined to hold on to our religious, cultural, and family life ways. Due to relocation and the constant historical appropriation of Native culture and religion, spaces for authentic gathering and ceremony in urban centers are limited. Daybreak Star offers the urban Native community of Seattle one of those spaces. The Indian Relocation Act was passed in 1956 in an effort to continue the termination and assimilation of tribal members. This act was designed to encourage tribal members to relocate to the cities with Bureau of Indian Affairs Relocation Act centers set up to assist with job training, grants to purchase household goods and clothing, and the provision of housing. By 1960, 25% of Native Americans lived in the cities. By 1970, nearly half did. Here in Seattle, by 1970, there were over 4,000 Native Americans living in the city. Unfortunately, this program had devastating effects on the people who moved to the city. An underfunded, ill-conceived program, essentially a one-way ticket from rural to urban poverty, as one BIA commissioner put it, this program was found to result in increased rates of depression, substance abuse, and harm to generations of urban Indian families. Racism was rampant in the cities, and the housing and job assistance often failed to materialize, leaving families trapped in cycles of poverty that often continue to this day. The roots of this harm are broadly recognized to be the disconnection to Native culture, community, and family. Isolated from tribal connections, the anonymity of the cities was the deepest kind of culture shock. However, Indigenous people are, at our core, resilient. The post-war termination era was no match for Native community building, and urban centers soon became home to Indian centers, gathering places that provided familiar food, clothing and resources, as well as cultural connections, singing, drumming, and traditional medicine. The government's still trying to, they're still scratching their head. How in the hell do these people survive, you know, and these small pots on their blankets and we gave them each other alcohol and we're supposed to be statement by the help of our own government. And somehow we still find a place to create home. <laughs> In response to the civil rights movement, these urban centers became spaces for indigenous activists and youth to form activist groups, such as the American Indian Movement, the National Indian Youth Council, Indians of All Tribes, and in Seattle, the American Indian Women's Service League, which was a social services organization that was often the first stop for native people when arriving in Seattle. A volunteer with the AIWSL was Bernie White Bear, who together with nearly 100 urban Indian activists, founded the United Indians of All Tribes Foundation and took over the recently decommissioned land at Fort Lawton in the Magnolia neighborhood of Seattle. In 1868, the U.S. Army at Fort Laramie signed a treaty with the Great Sioux Nation. In that treaty, it is specified that military installations on unceded Indian land should be closed and the land returned to the tribes. This was the justification used by Bernie White Bear Randy Lewis and other Native activists who saw that the political and cultural mood was ripe for Native people to take militant action against what they saw as the occupying force of the U.S. military. On March 8, 1970, more than 100 protesters scaled the chain link fences of Fort Lawton and set up a circle of teepees, signs, and drums, beginning a month-long occupation. Violently removed and arrested by the U.S. military and Seattle Police Department, nonetheless, the protests continued and swelled to over a thousand Indians and allies before they finally withdrew on April 1st, 1970. Though the occupation was over, public sentiment was on the side of the Native organizers and negotiations with the city and state officials began. Pressure on the BIA commissioner, Louis Bruce, resulted in a hold being placed on the land so that the city could not acquire it. 
Democratic presidential candidate Henry Jackson threw his weight behind the Native communities' petitions to be granted the land, and in November of 1971, the city of Seattle granted UIATF 20 acres of land for a 99-year lease. Bernie White Bear was adamant that this agreement was not called a treaty because historically treaties were regularly broken by the white government. Grants, donations, and City of Seattle funds were brought together to build the $1.2 million cultural center, which took its name from a prophecy by Lakota spiritual leader, Black Elk. The Daybreak Star Indian Cultural Center was opened to the community on May 13, 1977. My name is Colleen Jolly, and I'm a descendant of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa. My dad was an enrolled member there. And that's in North Dakota and about 10 miles south of the Canadian border. So to me, um, participating in that uh, occupation of Fort Lawton was very exciting because I was, I was working and hanging with other Indian people. And it was a decidedly Indian event. It was all focused on Indians. And that was really cool to me, really exciting because I had lived here and there and everywhere, but never quite a concentration of native only, native primarily activity. So that was a first for me. And it was very exciting. And I got there by being in, um, I was only 22 years old and I was four months pregnant and I was single. This was 1970. So that was not un that uncommon. Um, but uh, I had morning sickness. I had special consideration. I just only started to learn, learn about these people and knew about and introduced to all these heavy hitters that I had previously seen on the news on TV and suddenly, you know, like the Frank's Landing people and the fish wars and everything. And then here they are, they're right here. I'm working with them. So it was quite a thrill. I have to say, I was, I was impressed by the people I was working with and the school district, this Kanechitaki office shared a building um, in South Seattle uh, that another group was part of. And that was Bernie White Bear and Freddie Lane and those guys who organized this whole thing. And so people were coming there to have meetings and the, our conference room filled up with these incredible human beings and I, my main job was just to give them rides here and there. Most of them were from out of town. And, or if they were in town, they might not have cars and stuff. So I had a little car and, um, and I drove people here and there. And um, one of the people, in fact, was Leonard Peltier. We became friends because he's from the same reservation I am, but lived in Seattle. And my role in this big event was not a leadership role. It was just support. And I was, and I hardly knew anybody. And, but uh, I still participated and went to the encampment, hung out at the encampment all day, every day. I attended those planning meetings with all these heavy hitters, these AIM guys. And they're talking about how they're going to do whatever it is they're going to do. And plotting and scheming. And so uh, to be part of that was um, a thrill and kind of scary. And I couldn't imagine not doing it. It was a call to action. It was a calling to do whatever I could do in that moment with what I had. And so, um, <coughs> so I did. It was, it was a connect activity the the people who had started that been down in Alcatraz came up to the northwest to help with the fishing wars and camped at Frank's Landing and also spearheaded the work of working with uh, Bernie White Bear at um, 
for the Daybreak Star. It wasn't the Daybreak Star yet. It was for this action at Fort Lawton. I had to work at my job and I had to babysit for my sister. And so uh, the occupation of Fort Lawton kind of had to be patched in around those other priorities, right? And um, and that was okay. I mean, that, that was fine. We, we rushed the fort a couple of times. I was in one of those, one of those um, events where we gathered up in front of the main gate and we just rushed right through the main gate and we got in and ran in as far as we could get. And then um, we were, you know, but this was all very well planned and we sat down on the grass and we did not fight with the MPs. We did not antagonize. We did not carry any weapons or anything like that. We just ran in and I had a couple of big strong Indian women on either side of me because I was pregnant and they kept took care of me. And when the MPs came to haul us away, we just sat there and they had to literally pick us up by our arms and put us in the in the Jeep that would take us to the brig. So we were in jail, all jailed up together there. And it was kind of quiet in the women's cell, but the men's cell was a lot, there was a lot more um, uh, resistance and um, harsh treatment and beatings and things like that that happened to the men that the, we, did, we were not privy to that in the women's section and nobody treated me badly because I was pregnant. So I just wanted to hear what does Daybreak Star mean to you? Well, I love it that it's a home for you. Since I'm no longer living in Seattle, I, I stayed in touch with it by remote, uh, you know, stories and by going back there every once in a while and seeing it be there. And it, there's a source of pride for me to know that I helped establish it, just even the small part that mm -hmm. I had in it. It was as much as I could do. So I feel good about the fact that it, that Bernie White Bear continued on with the work and did the meetings and all the, the political stuff that had to happen and the finances and the fundraising and the building, the architectural building and all that kind of stuff. Um, so to me, it's very satisfying to know that it's there. People use it, people need it. The, the uh, native people in the city of Seattle use it a lot. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy about that. Mm -hmm. My name is Cole. Today, Daybreak Star is the heart of the urban Indian community in Seattle. The beauty of this location cannot be overstated. It is perched on the cliffs above Shills Hole Bay with a view of the Salish Sea to the north and west. The building was designed by Lonnie Reyes to honor the four directions with a wide open gathering space and locally sourced materials used throughout. Surrounded by carefully cultivated gardens of indigenous plants and trees, there isn't anywhere on the property in which visitors cannot feel the influence of the native lifeways we share with our environment. This includes western red cedar trees, nettle, yarrow, salal, salmonberry, plantain, and elderberry. All are sacred plants used as medicine in a myriad of ways by the tribes across Washington state. A traditional sweat lodge frame and fire put pit is tucked into the woods, used regularly by UIATF to offer sweats to urban indigenous folks. We regularly gather here for events such as Indigenous Peoples Day, anniversaries and celebrations for local organizations, and gatherings at key times during the year, such as the winter solstice. The annual Seafair Indian Days powwow hosted for the past 30 years on our beloved powwow grounds just behind the center, is the largest powwow in Seattle proper and often the only one that urban community members can easily attend. At each gathering, traditional foods are prepared and shared, 
often using traditional ways of cooking and serving locally harvested salmon, methods that have been used since time immemorial by local tribes. In an echo of the American Indian Women's Service League, the United Indians of All Tribes Foundation continues today as a social services organization. They offer an indigenous immersion preschool, a family visitation and fatherhood support program, veterans programs, homelessness and eviction prevention, elders programs, youth services and a youth shelter, education and job training and meal services for those most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Respected throughout the community, this place has become more than just land taken back through activism. Inside and outside the building, art is a uniquely indigenous presence on every wall and in every corner. At first glass, glance, a non-native observer may walk into the facility and not understand the purpose behind what seems to be a mismatched jumble of native art styles, motifs, and eras. Much of the art in the center does not reflect traditional Coast Salish artistic, cultural, and religious practices, such as this piece entitled Buffalo Hunt by Glenn LaFontaine, a Plains Cree artist. There is also Pueblo art, such as this piece called Deer Hunt by San Juan Pueblo member Robert Montoya, and this redwood panel titled Underwater Panthers by Chippewa artist George Morrison also add to what seems to be a disconnect from the first inhabitants of this particular area. The Earth is Our Mumber Mother by a Muscogee Creek tribal member, Jimmy Carroll Fife, represents the five dominant tribes from the Southwest region with elements representing the forced relocation of their people along the Trail of Tears, as well as the green corn ceremony and the ceremonial icons representing the ancient mound builders of the Southeast. Epochs of the Plains history, Mother Earth, Father Son, the Children Themselves by art, Kiowa artist T.C. Cannon traces the spiritual path from emergence of people through history to the white buffalo woman, an important spiritual figure in Plains Indian religious traditions. That being said, Coast Salish tribal influences and art are present throughout the building. These are just a few of the many carvings, paintings, totems, masks, and baskets representative of local tribal cultures and religions. This collection of art was primarily funded and still owned by the city of Seattle and now resides on permanent display at Daybreak Star. The Sacred Circle Gallery is an opportunity for visitors to purchase indigenous art, featuring indigenous artists and craftspeople and offering a chance to support the efforts of United Indians of All Tribes Foundation Social Services Program. The Indians Arts and Crafts Act ensures that the right to sell authentic native art rests solely with native people and that tribal members are the ones to profit from the designs and techniques handed down through generations. Unfortunately, the artifacts here, including baskets, masks, and art, as well as the right to conduct ceremony on our reclaimed urban reservation land, are unfortunately not protected under the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, nor the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. The land is still owned by the city of Seattle, but leased to UIATF, which does not place the land under federal nor tribal jurisdiction. And due to city of Borne v. Flores, does not allow for protection under ERFA in the state of Washington. As mentioned by Barsham, these acts do not go far enough to protect the sanctity of ceremonies, objects, and sites that do not fall under the protection of a federally recognized Indian tribe, excluding the public from wandering through a sacred ceremony on the grounds of Daybreak Star comes with limited federal or state authority, risking cultural tourism as a byproduct of such a centralized site. So why the disconnect, the disparity in artistic representations? Why are non-Coast Salish tribes so prominently represented in what is a uniquely Coast Salish traditional cultural center? Because of relocation, because thousands of tribal members from tribes across Turtle Island were displaced to urban centers. And when they and their descendants walk into the sacred space, we feel at home. As an Oglala tribal member, I respect and enjoy the form line and simple colors of Coast Salish art the rhythms of the canoe songs. I love tasting freshly caught and traditionally prepared salmon, nettle pesto, and huckleberry jam. 
but the bright colors and delicate lines seen in ledger art, the subject of horses and Tatanka, the teepees and the reminders of the warrior spirit of the Plains tribes, these items, things speak to my soul. They tell me I am home here, hundreds of miles from my reservation, I am home. These are my people. This is my reservation. These people are my family. The collection of art is representative of over 360 tribes from across North America in an effort to ensure that urban indigenous people from every tradition across Turtle Island feel that same sense of belonging and homecoming. What seems to a non-practitioner of native religious and cultural traditions as a mere curiosity, a tourist spot made up of incompatible discordant elements of various native traditions is seen by native people as a center of hope, a sacred space, and the heart of the urban native community of Seattle.